Okay. Um, aloha and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone uh, for attending the talk this afternoon and a short friendly reminder that the musical album uh, Le Na Honoa Pi'ilani Songs of West Maui and Le Na Honoa Pi'ilani Na Meleho are available digitally and also at mele.com and the accompanying songbook uh, distributed by Kamehameha Publishing is also available um, at stores and on their website. Proceeds from the album and the albums and the book go to Na Leo Kalele, the West Maui Kula Kayapuni Auxiliary Organization. And also, if you are a member of HARA, we ask you to consider voting for Le Nahono Pi'ilani Na Meleho in the preliminary ballot. Thank you, mahalo. <laughs> Kanani, did you want to do the introduction? Aloha. Mili na mai mahalo everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, since 2018, the Na'ai Faneo Maui Culture Center has been hosting the Free Public uh, HK West Maui Community Fund um, Kanaka Scholars Lecture Series. Um, the series is co-sponsored by HK West Maui Community Fund, the University of Hawaii uh, Maui College Hawaiian Studies Department, and the Kue uh, Partition Hui. Um, the lectures occur monthly, and the series features a host of new and established scholars, also innovators, and their research and work on Hawaii and Hawaiian communities. Um, we proudly present this to you via Zoom and live through our HK West Maui's uh, Facebook page. Tonight's presentation using Pono Science to achieve an Aina Momona. Noilani Punuai, a professor at the Kakuokani Center for Hawaiian Studies. Uh, she's passionate about cultivating the next generation of students to Malama Aina. Uh, Noilani is from Puna on Hawaii Island. Uh, her research interests include ancestral Hawaiian knowledge, regarding the Aina, coastal ecosystems, cultural geography, uh, seascapes, climate change, and the most definitely Kanaloa. Loyalani believes that we can use the rigor and mythologies <laughs> of Pono science, the foundational wisdom of our kupuna and our experimental daily practice of Aloha Aina to awaken our responsible uh, action for the future of our Hawaii. Give our uh, virtual round of applause for tonight's speaker, Noelani Punuvai. Uh, aloha, Noelani. Aloha, Kanani. Mahalo for that introduction. I'll start with sharing my screen. And hopefully, my internet um, follows through tonight. It's been kind of iffy. But aloha, my kako. Mahalo for joining me tonight um, for just a little mo'olalo on my journey um, through school, research, teaching, and of course, Aina. Um, I hope I leave you with questions and also the hope and thoughts of Hawaii's abundant future in Aina Momona. Oh, there we go. Aloha. I'm joining you tonight from Waikahekahe in Puna, where I live with my three keiki. My name is Noelani Punivai, and I'm the daughter of Gary and Judy Punivai, my ancestry. Um, stems from the families of Punivai, Carvalho, Kimi, and on the island of Maui, the Tavares. Uh, I have three keiki, as I said. Um, that's a picture of them many years ago. Um, and I'm just going to warn you that there's pictures of them throughout my mo'olalo that I'm sharing with you tonight, because as any loving academic scholarly mom, I take my kids everywhere with me. And so that's kind of how I document my journey is through my love of them um, and them just going holo holo with me everywhere. I am so happy to be back here in Pune. Um, Pune is where I'm raised. Um, and I was happy to return after my little ed educational journey back to Pune. Um, and because of these COVID times, as I'm joining you here from Puna, um, I have been able to stay home in my homeland for about a year now. Um, I teach at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, but I call Puna my home. These are some pictures of Kapoho on Hawaii Island. Uh, my great grandmother had a house there that she built by hand. That pond that you see in the lower left hand corner um, was a pond that my great grandmother built by hand. Um, pulling out rocks by rocks from the Punavai, just as all the different 
um, houses in that little neighborhood did before. Um, that was our van that we got around with as a kid, going holo holo all around the island. And just as I have grown up and moved and changed, so has this Aina, right? So the pictures on the left were from when I was a kid back in 1988. I was able to take my kids there and my son did his first snorkel transect in 2014 on the same reef that I learned through UH Hilo. I graduated with a marine science degree from UH Hilo back in about 2000. Um, and I learned all of my underwater quantitative surveying techniques um, here in these Kapoho tide pools. And so it was so exciting for me to teach my children those same techniques. And then yet a few years ago, Pele came, yeah? And she changed this Aina and she changed it. She added new pools, new beaches. She took away old beaches. She netted the fish over, changed the coral reef environment. Um, but that's what Pele does, right? Um, and for me here in Hawaii, we know that this area in Kapoho that I was so connected to as a child was hurting. It wasn't Momona anymore. Maybe the coral was healthy. Maybe the invertebrates were healthy, but the waters weren't healthy. There is an influx of sewage from the, the increasing development from the lack of cesspools and septic tanks. And we were seeing the increases of diseases along this entire coastline from human um, diseases mostly, but just the transfer of of human impact along the coastline. And now it's closer to a state of Pono where the Aina is healing, it's in abundance and it'll do, it'll heal and go through its cycles just as Pele does. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit tonight about the different Akua, the different environmental energies that exist that we try to learn more about because by learning through them, we connect to them and we learn how to live alongside of them, not to dominate them, but to live in the same Aina as them. Who is Kanaloa? This is a question that I pose to my students in the courses that I teach. It's a question that I've been studying my whole life, trying to get to know this deity, trying to get to know who Kanaloa is, the different functions, properties, um, the different movements, energies that it has. I was first challenged with this question um, back in Opuna'eau, back in my youth with Kekuhi um, and Tangaro on our many trips to the Kai or to Kanaloa. Um, we knew we always went to bond with Kanaloa. And I tell my students that now, what is the best way to do research? The best way is to bond with your Akuas, to know who they are. This is something I love to do with my children along the shoreline. My Hina element definitely comes out along the coastline where Hina dominates all her cycles, the tides, the living invertebrates, all the different species that live there. This place where Kanaloa and Pele meet. I take my kids on treasure hunts. You can see here we um, gathering pa'akai, looking for molts, gathering seashells that will return or that will share with others. Because by knowing these places, by visiting them, by taking time and spending things in them, that's Hawaiian research. That's how we learn about our place. That's how we learn about our kupuna. That's how we learn about our akua. When I decided to start my PhD, my questions were mostly about understanding more about our environments and how we could manage them better. And so the first years of my PhD, I just spent listening. I wanted to learn more about the connections that people have to our ocean, to our world, what drives them and what do they understand about the world that they live in every day. I use this Olelo no Eau, Ike Keau Nui Keau Iki, Healo Healo, to know um, more about our ocean, those big ideas, those little ideas, and how we learn them face to face. Um, I use this Olelo Neo as part of my PhD thesis um, because it just encouraged me and it grounded me to know that I can't just study one little thing, but I have to understand the larger picture. I also like it because it's talking about Kiao Nui and Kiao Iki, the currents and how our oceans move. There is so much that our kupuna and our watermen know about our oceans that oceanographers are, are barely able to comprehend because they have to use 
um, technology and instruments and they have to model it. And so they have to step back and look at the big picture and they might lose sight at the little picture. And so I wanted to work in that environment right in the middle of how do you go from big to little? How do you understand things at all levels? And most importantly, I wanted to work by learning about our Hawaiian watermen because I think they are the solution for understanding how to take care of our resources. They have the ideas on how to prepare for climate change in these people that are still connected to the ocean and to our resources. So I listened to the watermen, those who experience the true ocean. In my research, I found a saying by Anita Marstad and she actually wrote about Norway communities far across the ocean. And she stated when their fishermen no longer used the seascape, this ocean environment, when they no longer perpetuated their knowledge on place names, understanding the local conditions, when you no longer use these things, then it disappears and the ocean becomes a wilderness, an empty expanse for anyone to occupy. This makes me sad, but it also makes me proud that we need to see the ocean as a cultural space. In our worldview, we understand that this is a place that we live in, that we interact with. Antipua Kanaka Ole says that culture anchors people to a space-based reality. And the sea is home to many cultures still surviving and connected to the place today. So that's what I wanted to learn more about. This connection that people have today with the Aina, both what drives them and what they understand, how they understand their names and places of the Kai. And although I've worked in my past in the Kahawai and the Kohivi, most of my practice has been along the ocean, along the seashore, talking to fishermen, paddlers, lifeguards. And I think our solution is in these people who experience Kanaloa personally. A little bit on how I got here. Um, I grew up, as I said, in Puna and Hilo and Hawaii Island. Um, I've paddled and steered canoes since I was a young girl. I also danced in the Halao Kekuhi. Um, I took these experiences with me into college and I actually lived them pretty separately for a while. I got my undergraduate degree in marine science and Hawaiian studies at UH Hilo, um, working as a coral reef diver for the Division of Aquatic Resources for many years. And then I went away to um, Washington and I studied deep sea invertebrates along the seashores, 600 feet down in Washington and Oregon, very different environments. But for me, I saw the similarities. I saw all those same creatures that live on the ocean floor off Hawaii. They just look a little different off of Washington and Oregon. Um, I learned how to map. I did a lot with mapping technologies and gathering data and processing things um, so that we have a comprehensive understanding of everything that lives together. I looked at seascape ecology. Um, but yet that made me wonder for new techniques, for new models of understanding how things live together and how do you um, display them for others to understand. Um, the little image on the right is a little map that I made with some um, from colleagues of mine. We we're all students at the same time and we tried to map mo'olelo. How do you understand the travels of kahuiki manoa pu'uloa the shark that was born in Puna, but traveled throughout Hawaii and Kahiki and returned. How do we understand what is captured in them olelo about the ocean by mapping it, by reading it and transcribing it? Um, these are the kind of questions that have led me in my journeys today. So I return to the topic of my, uh, of my talk with you today. That was just a little intro of who I am using Pono science to achieve an Aina Momona. I became a scientist because I love Hawaii. As you saw, I love, I wanna discover and share her stories. I wanna holo holo with my children and my students. I want to share her histories and genealogies and her future. And I've used science as this mechanism, but now I've changed my method and I've changed the way of sharing that. And I wanna ensure that we're sharing it through a Pono science method. And what we're looking for is not good science and good results. What we're looking and striving for is an aina momona. So the love and respect that is achieved between human and aina when all is in balance is pono. And I propose that we adopt a pono framework when we talk about science in Hawaii. 
And I believe that our search for a just science must be cultivated in all the work we do, our proposals, our classrooms, our methods, when you work in indigenous landscapes. So ultimately what we're striving for, the reason I became a scientist is to make sure my Aina thrives so that it's abundant once again. I share with you a story for one of my best friends and colleagues, Kalea Aloha Lam Ho, who originally hears from Maui and Molokai, um, although I got to know her when she was a student with me at, um, on Hawaii Island. Kalei states, following the arrests on Mauna Kea in April 2015, I, like many of my peers, felt frustrated and helpless. Not knowing how I could help the movement, I heard about a rally that was being organized at the Capitol and knew I needed to be there. Having spent almost 10 years working with Native Hawaiian students in STEM, I had seen firsthand how beneficially culturally grounded science is, and I wanted to convey that message at the rally. I thought about all the good work my friends were doing, successfully balancing science and culture, and came up with this sign. To Kale, she states that Pono science was about contributing to science without sacrificing what is held sacred. As an educator, she believed that Pono science has the power to encourage students to pursue science while remaining grounded in their culture and values. Isn't she amazing? That's why I love her. She's able to articulate what so many of us couldn't at that time. Hawaiian scientists were struggling to know their place, um, to make sure what they were doing as students, as researchers, was something that they could be proud of. And I use this model to ground me in the research that I do and how I talk with my students about science. So again, her definition of Pono science was about contributing to science without sacrificing what is held sacred. So I started my journey into science to learn more about the places I love and of course to protect them. When I was a student back then, we were all scared about the future of the rainforest, right? Remember, it was all about save your rainforest, our oceans, our planets. Yet 30 years later, I reflect on the progress we've made and the health of our environment. And I have to ask, why is my island home not thriving? Why does the reef seem emptier and lifeless? What was preventing us from a healthy ecosystem? I started really understanding different ways of knowing and trying to see how your epistemology, how you see the world affects the science you do, the questions you ask, the methods you use, how you have management actions based on the way you look at the world and interact with the world. When you initially gaze at the sea, at first glance, most people just see a homogeneous expanse of ocean. It looks the same. It doesn't look like any place, any process is more important. It's just this vast open area, right? It's difficult to place value on specific locations. Yet humans have done that for centuries. We call this the biocultural approach to mapping the seascape. When we use a biocultural approach to understand the ocean, then we can encode the geography the way humans are connected to this Aina. We can understand how human use different areas. In this illustration, I've kind of labeled a few areas, the Kai Hohonu, the Kai Heleku, the Kai Kaheka. And we've also mapped using geospatial technologies, what these areas might look like using different sorts of aerial imagery, right? All these are different ways to assign value to the ocean to mentally map the oceanscape, to encode species of interest, resource use, and ocean management. The Hawaiians had their own way of mapping the ocean through their words. And this is something I'm really excited to learn more about. And my students in my classes help me as we try to understand more, what is a kai heleku and what is a kai hohonu? What makes them differ? And how can we place management actions based on these ideas on how they categorize it, not based on rocky substrate versus sandy shoreline, um, you know, but how do we map it using the categories that our kupuna placed on the kai? So in the research that I've done, I've been starting to go through the Hawaii newspapers, 
um, going through and understanding the olelo and how we use our olelo to define different areas. And I also talk to the watermen, as I mentioned before. Um, one of the chapters that I did for my PhD was communication of ocean current knowledge. I interviewed surfers and uh, lifeguards and paddlers, and they helped me map out the ocean currents around Hilo. I mean, just Hilo itself is so complex, but we don't have ocean current maps around Hawaii on any of our islands. Um, most of oceanographers work a little more offshore where those larger currents are easier to map. Um, as anyone who knows the ocean, you know how quickly the ocean currents can change. But yet, if you're an astute observer and you go to that kai all the time, you also know what makes those changes happen. And you can predict if it's this sort of wind or this sort of tide, this is what the ocean might look like. We have these variables in us and we know how to, to map our areas out. What I mostly learned, however, through this chapter of listening to ocean um, watermen and trying to map out ocean currents was that everybody describes and explains their understanding of the ocean in different ways. Some people are able to tell it to you in a story. Some are able to draw it on a map. Some aren't able to explain it to you, but they'll tell you a fishing story. And from that mo'olalo, you need to understand what kind of position they're trying to talk to you about and which way the ocean was moving based on their boat and where they let their bait down. Um, this, of course, is the funnest type of research when you get to listen to these amazing ocean um, observers. One of the fun um, graphs I was able to take from all of their ocean current information, however, um, is this little diagram. And what you see here is the scale of how people interact with the ocean, both in time, that's temporal, and in space, spatial. So in, um, oh, and I think I have those axes wrong there. In both spatial and temporal such. Um, so when we start to look at the ways people act with the ocean, what we understand is a surfer, you know, he interacts in a small space. For me, most of my work was done in Kelkaha or Honolii, a yeah, small little bay, and he might be out there for a minute to an hour. That's at the scale that he's interested in how the ocean moves, right? When he's in that space. Fishermen, you know, might um, travel a longer distance. They might stay out there for a longer period of time. Canoe paddlers, similarly, fishermen out on boats, um, they'll go further than a shoreline fisherman. And similarly, a sailor, he might go out for longer periods and longer um, distances. What you see in gray are the different oceanographic um, conditions and the scientific instruments we use to monitor um, ocean currents, the high frequency radar, the ROMS model, the HICOM model. And what we see is that there isn't much of an overlap between the data that we get from these sensor instruments and the data that we need when we interact with the ocean. When a surfer checks the surf report, he's interested in a different temporal and spatial scale of information than the data that's created out there. But we know that we can make models that are at the same scale. We also know that we can make scientific instruments that gather data at scales that are useful to humans and not just useful for modeling generic ocean movements. We need to find data that's created in ways that are accessible to people who are on the ocean. Yeah, data that can help us malama our aina, understand Kanaloa's movements and how we can be safe in her, how can we thrive in her. Um, and we just have to know that we need to bridge these divides. <clears throat> so we need researchers that can talk to our watermen who understand the ocean, who have the skills to translate this into different programs that we can use. This interested me in also understanding what are other ways that we can start to learn from our ocean observers and start using it in how we understand the interaction of humans in the ocean. And so when you think of the best observers out there, I think of surfers. Surfing is one of the very few physical activities, recreational activities, sports, whatever you want to call it. They're one of the very few activities where you're completely reliant on natural environment. We're not talking about, you know, wave models or things that are created on land, but if you're surfing in the ocean, 
you cannot change the conditions. You have to change. You have to know. You have to adapt. You have to learn to read the ocean if you want to surf, if you want to be a good surfer. Um, and so that makes surfers the best kilos out there. And they don't just kilo the ocean. They're just not sitting on the beach. They also kilo technology. They're the ones checking out the surf report. They're the ones reading the buoys. They're the ones understanding um, what the ocean conditions are, what the weather forecast is to make sure that they're ready when the best sets come in. Yeah. Um, so because I live in Hilo and Puna, um, I chose Honolii as my surf spot. It also made it really easy because Hawaii, Hilo in particular, doesn't have a lot of um, choices when it comes to surf spots. So there's a lot of site fidelity. The people who live in Hilo surf at Honolii. Um, but also what was really important to me is that people have been surfing in Honolii for generations. Hi'iaka, in her quest to find Lohi'ao, surfed at Honolii. This is written down in her mo'olalo. So if this surf site has, has existed for centuries, how will it exist into the future? Will we still have surf as climate changes? That's what I asked surfers. So I had this long questionnaire for them. Um, I did both survey work and interviews with them. Um, and if this looks kind of confusing, I'll step you through it. The graph in the middle is called a wave rose. Most surfers know what this is, but people like me have to get a little bit introduced to it. Um, and what the wave rose is showing you is what direction the wave swell is coming in. Um, and although I don't have a legend, the colors of it tell you how frequently it was coming in from those directions um, and the size of the swell. So here in Honolulu, we know that we get most of our swell coming from the east um, because that's where the trade winds are coming and wrapping into Hilo. Um, and a lot of the waves come from the northwest. Um, however, those waves don't actually hit Honolulu. But what I asked the, um, the surfers, just for us to get an understanding, um, as you can see, I have A, B, C, and D there. Um, and what we see is, I asked them, how's the surf when it comes from direction A? Is it flat? Is it a poor surf, fair surf, good, or is it epic surf conditions? And what we see um, from the four directions is that when the surf comes from C, when it comes from the northeast direction, that's the best surf conditions that we have. And it was fairly, um, uh, a lot of people said that. Yeah, a lot of people said that that's the kind of the best surf conditions they are. When it comes from the A direction, you can see on left, that's definitely flat, poor, fair conditions. As you get more towards the east in B and C, that's the prime conditions for surfing. When you get straight out of the east, like in D, it's not the best surf conditions, right? So we know that surfers understand their surf. They all kind of um, see the ocean the same way in that sense. Um, I asked them a lot of qualitative questions too. Like, when is the best surfing day? It's, tell me what's the best surf conditions at Honolulu. And the first answers you get are not going to be the size of the wave or the direction that the wave comes out. The first response you're going to get is it's when it's a beautiful day, when it's glassy and the water is clean, when there's a light rain sprinkling, which is kind of often here in Hilo. When your friends are with you, when people are following the rules, when everyone's smiling makes it even better, right? So what this tells us is that surf quality, the ability for people to enjoy surfing, so the best surf quality isn't just dependent on the physical variables of the wave, it also depends on social conditions and what the day is like and what kind of mood you're in, right? All of those conditions along with the aina helps you have a great surf day. Um, however, we do what we, so I can't really change the social conditions. I can't change if your friends are there with you or if you're in a happy mood, but what I can model is what the, is what the ocean and the environment's gonna be like. And so I presented them a lot of different models telling them what the environment has looked like in Honolulu over the last um, you know, 50, 60 years. And then we try to talk about predictions from this data. So just to explain to you a little bit um, and share with you a little bit about climate change um, and how climate change has been impacting Honolulu. Um, and so the next few slides um, are specific to what the climate is like 
um, in Honolulu. Um, and these graphs are kind of old now because I finished this research back in about 2015 or so. But we can say is that here in the Honolulu River, the rainfall and the stream flow have been declining for the last 30 years, and that's a significant decrease in rainfall and discharge. Um, and that's not something we're all happy about. Um, we know that in Honolulu, because they're surfing at a river mouth, that the flow of the river is a big indicator and um, it changes the beach conditions um, with different rainfalls. And so the beach, the um, the boulders underneath the surf, all of those are different now than they were 30 years ago. We also know that the wave height, that's in red here, the height of waves that hit Honolulu um, and hit kind of the whole east side of Hawaii based on the wave buoy has been also declining over the th last 30 years. It's almost um, in equal comparison to the decrease in wind over the last 30 years. And this has been shown both in our trade winds and in the strength of the wind that hits um, Hilo. And we know that over the last um, 30 years, we have almost 100 days less of trade wind weather. There's been a very significant decline in the, the steadiness of the trade winds that hit us. Um, and that is shown also in the decrease in the waves because all waves, ocean waves are generated by wind. Um, another way to show that is the direction of the waves has also been changing. So these are different oceanographic conditions. These are the storms um, and things that happen offshore. Um, and we can say the wave direction, the same wave rows I showed you before. Um, the top graph is showing you what the waves were like in 2012. Um, and the bottom one is showing you in general, um, kind of an average of what the wave direction was like over a four year period from 2009 to 2013. Um, and we can see that traditionally, most of the waves would have come out of the east, like we said, where our trade winds come out of in the northeast. Um, but in 2012, which is one of those hot and just funky years on record, um, that most of the waves came out of the northwest. Um, and so we know that our wave direction is changing as well. And then finally, the other condition we look at is sea level. Um, so I know a lot of you guys are, you know, you hear about sea level rise um, and you think about, you know, how is that going to impact Hawaii? Well, I can say that here in Hilo, and this is something that we're used to, in the last hundred years, so we have data going back to 1920s here in Hilo, um, we've had a foot of sea level rise in the last hundred years. So we've already seen a foot of increase. However, not all of this is because of sea level rise, but some of this is because our ocean, our aina is actually um, subducting, it's going, it's getting lower. And so our aina is actually sinking while the ocean is rising. And that's why Hilo has a really high level of um, sea change. Um, so all of these conditions has been changing for the last 30 years. So climate change isn't something that Hilo is going to see. It's something that we've been experiencing for most of my lifetime. So when I ask the question, has surf changed? I get a mixed bag of responses. Many people, um, and I did interview over a hundred different surfers all over the age of 18. You can't really um, interview um, kids, but it ranged from the age of 18 to the age of 70 or 80. Um, and many people there had surfed for decades at Honolulu. And a lot of people will say that surf was better in the past. We had better surf conditions, more storms, better surf at the break points. It's the one on the Northwest, um, more consistent trade winds, less surfers. Some people though say there's no real change. Um, that things such as erosion and the sandbar, they change the surf quality more than the environmental changes are. Um, and they all say though, no matter if they say the surf has changed or not, that there are always good days of surfing. There's too many to remember and it's always fun to jump in no matter what. So what are my takeaways from understanding surf um, climate change by talking to surfers? The first thing I can take away is that surfers and scientists understand change differently. Uh, and what I mean is, so if you just look at the scientific data, you'll see that all the conditions that make good surf, wind, waves, sea level height have been declining for 30 years. But when you ask the surfers, has your surf quality declined over 30 years? They're gonna tell you no, or most people are, um, will say it depends. And that's because it, again, it's not just the physical conditions that change, but the social conditions are changed. 
when you go to surf, you're not just surfing a particular ocean break at Honolulu. You're going to Honolulu. You're going to a place that maybe you're raised in. You're going to a place that friends introduced you to. You're going with your keiki now. So you're not the same surfer at 50 that you were when you were 10. Yeah, when you were 10 years old, you had a different expectation of surf than when you were 50. So you as a Kanaka change, that Aina changes, that community, the Lahui of surfers change. So all of those changes together. And that's the most important takeaway to understand um, implications of climate change and how do we talk about climate change in the future is that you can't predict something based on data alone. The data has to include the Kanaka. It has to include the people of the place because we change along with our Aina. And if we are thriving and the Aina is, we can make that sure that the Aina thrives as well. Um, I've been, um, I haven't been doing too much climate change research recently, but I did wanna say, I recently put in a proposal to work with um, some more communities in Waehu and Maui to understand how climate change has been affecting them, doing these similar things, looking at historical maps, looking at how people talked about the weather in the past at Waehu. What was it like? What was the wind like? What were the waves like? Um, what was it like in your kupuna's time, in your time? And how was it today, both through storytelling and with physical parameters and bringing those together to understand how we're gonna move forward into the future, um, knowing what variables are important Now I come to one of the main key words in my title, pono. It's a word that we kind of all hear in Hawaii. Um, and it's a word that I've been sharing more and more with the different research communities that I interact with. And it's because that I think this word moves us beyond words like sustainability and environment. I hope you noticed that I didn't say the word sustainability in, the, in previous slides when I talk about climate change. We understand that things change, right? We also understand that there's a way to achieve pono in everything that we do. Um, and so I like this word pono because it's not just a state of being, but it's also a process. And it connects aina and kanaka together. So both people and the environment that they live in are both part of the word pono. A quote by Kumu Janka Imikawa from Moloka'i states that the love and respect that is achieved between humans and the environment when all is flourishing is pono. It shows us that in the value of Hawaii about talking about how we live, what we eat, and in the model of our Hawaiian kingdom, our landscapes, our peoples, our communities will only continue through a vision of pono. And so I use this word of pono to relate to your way of being in the world. It goes beyond doing ethical science. It goes beyond just understanding how to do just work. I like to challenge people with the word pono because it makes sure that there are motivation in seeking pono is not in just for ourselves, but in the prosperity for all communities, humans and non-humans. We look at the concept of pono during three different phases of our research. Yeah, the first in the search for righteousness and prosperity. So hopefully the research you're doing is because you want something to thrive, because you want to understand and help something become mona again. Um, either Kanaka communities or Aina communities, you want to help, yeah? You wanna be a part of that search for momona. Um, pono is also the action of doing good. So in all your interior actions, both with the Aina and with your researchers, your students, um, that you're doing good in all of those environments. And finally, Pono is a state of wellness achieved. You can actually achieve Pono. Um, and I challenge my students to ensure that during the research, going to school, during this time of COVID, that you make sure that you yourself is in a state of Pono. And if you're not, to take a step back and ensure that no matter how stressful life gets, if you're not in a state of pono, you can't move forward. You can't do good for the aina if you as a kanak is not pono. So what is pono science? I love this picture of my son Kaonohi. Um, this is taken many years ago on an akuli kuli bed in Kau, uh, near Kaalualu. And he knew the importance of this of this Akuli Kuli on the shoreline. He knew that this was a place of abundance. 
that this little landscape that we were in, that we were camping at was thriving. And he showed it by doing that. He ate of it, he lied and slept in it, and he just shared his aloha with it. But what is Pono science? To me, it's when you can feel this comfortable with what you're doing, that you are thriving, both Kanaka and Aina. And again, it's also what my friend Kale Aloha said about Pono science contributing to science without sacrificing what is held sacred. I have a class at UH Manoa, a graduate class called Pono Science. Um, and there's no answers in the class. There's just discussion. It's a space for students of all backgrounds to come and understand what it's like to do science in Hawaii. What are those values and expectations we have for them as researchers in Hawaii? How is it that they can give back and be the best selves that they can be while in Hawaii? I pull from a lot of the readings of Robin Wall Kimmerer and Braiding Sweetgrass. She states that being naturalized to place means to live as if this is the land that feeds you. As if these are the streams from which you drink that build your body and fill your spirit, to know that your ancestors lie in this ground, to live, it, to live as if your children's future matters, to take care of the land as if our lives and the lives of all our relatives depend on it, because they do. In her book, she talks about indigenous wisdom and ways of being in the world but she also tries to talk to those who aren't indigenous to this place. And what are, we, what are the expectations of them? It explains to them that you, maybe you can never be indigenous to this place, but you can be naturalized to it. You can live as if this is the land that feeds you. You can ensure that what you're striving for is Pono. And so Pono science begins by situating the work and the research you do in a place of reciprocity, respect, and mutual benefit and understanding. In our Pono science class, we talk about decolonization. We talk about how do we understand indigenous sovereignty of people and how do you recognize that in the research that you do, that the work that you do in an indigenous community belongs to that people. It belongs to them to, ID, to identify if it's what's gonna make them thrive, if it's what's gonna make them have control over their resources again, if it's gonna help them as a lahui with their aina become abundant. And so again, I come back to that word momona. I've been using it throughout this presentation and it's definitely one of my favorite words right now because this is why I do science. I do science because I want my aina to be momona. I want my lahui, my fellow um, indigenous, my students, my keiki, maybe not to be physically momona, but to be momona in their pu'uvai, in their love for the aina where we have Olenna and Liko and Limu growing along our share lines, where her kahavais aren't empty, but they're thriving and growing again, where we know that all our people, if you're living in an urban, if you're living in the rural, in the country, there are still ways to thrive and be momona in all of these settings. I work in a university setting. I work at Kamakaku Kalani Center for Hawaiian Studies at UH Manoa. Um, and I came to the Hawaiian, the Hawaiian Studies program from a very science background because I knew that if I want my aina to thrive, it's going to be through aloha. It's going to be through reaching people through their hearts to make action. I can tell you all the facts and statistics I want, but I can't change your heart. Only you can do that. So teaching in Hawaiian studies, all my students come with the heart. They come with their love and aloha for Hawaii, for the aina, and they want to make a difference. Many of the educational programs and STEM programs that exist are directed toward changing and preparing students so they engage in science and are successful in the paradigm of scientific institutions. But this hasn't been too successful because it's not our students that need changing, but the institutions of science needs to go beyond recognizing a single knowledge system. The solution lies in rethinking our institutions to be intellectually pluralistic, to be welcoming to holistic thinking and to indigenous knowledge. If we create a science based on indigenous principles of respect, reciprocity and responsibility, incorporating Hawaiian native knowledge, then there might not be a shortage of native students.
there's been a surge of Native peoples entering the science fields because we know it's our kuleana to malama our aina, to malama Hawaii, to learn how it functions, to love our akua, to move forward with protecting all our waters and ecosystems. The movement on Mauna Kea has made it forcefully clear that our people are not against science. I have loved the process of learning to be a scientist, being able to wonder at all the amazing um, aina and honua that we have. I've also enjoyed educating our people or re-educating them with the, what our kupuna once knew, sharing the messages of our watermen. I became a scientist because I love Hawaii and I wanna share her stories with others. And I can bring this because I've been raised between worlds of a scientist for a father and an educator for a mother. And I learned about Hawaiian ancestral knowledge through the practice of hula, through the teachings of the Kanaka Ole at Halao Ke Kuhi, and by being on the water in the va'a. I was also raised in the Napuna Oyao family. And I wanna pass this legacy along for all of the Lahui and inspiring the next generation that we can and must aloha aina. We can use the rigors and methodologies of modern science with the foundational wisdom of our kupuna to employ methods and act responsibly for the future of our resources. Science should benefit, not destroy. So my take home message is to love the places and people where you work, for it is only through these relationships that we make progress, save the places and people we love, and continue to build these bridges that allow us to have healthy and abundant lives and homes. I'll leave you with the saying from my colleague at Kamakakua Kalani, Kamaoli Kuwara, who wrote this WordPress article in 2015. And he described how people think we want to return to our past. That's why I teach in Hawaiian studies where our culture thrive and why I do want what is special to our culture. We're not trying to return to an ancient past. We are here, we are living, and we are fighting for an abundant future. So I ask each of you, how do you aloha kanaloa? These are the questions I ask my children as I hanai them to create their own relationships with Kanaloa, to know his depths, his confidence, his abundance, to learn to navigate their own future. PP Holoka'o. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, we're taking questions now. So, um, if you don't mind. And I, I do want to put in a plug that um, Kamali uh, Kuwata, he's going to be presenting in the series on July 12th. So um, thank you for mentioning that. Um, so the first question is, um, you said that science should benefit, not destroy. What jobs are there for your Pono science students? Aside from educator jobs, there seems to be more just like expert consultants that get hired to license their clients' development projects, like that kind of job. So um, what, what do you tell your students to work in? Yeah, I have another colleague, uh, Cheyenne Perry, who got his undergraduate degree with me. And he was speaking almost 10 years ago now, and he was saying the jobs that I am preparing you for don't exist yet. You are gonna make them. The world is changing. Um, and I see that now too. I think I felt the same way um, when I considered getting a PhD, because everyone said, how are you going to find a job in Pune with a PhD? Um, and things work out if you are, um, if you prepare yourself and, and you work at it. Most of the Hawaiian scientists that I know that are either have their degrees or still in school or working out there, um, they're in high demand actually. Um, and it's, if you have the skill set of working with your indigenous ancestors and if they guide your way, and you have the skill set and methodology um, that the academic, you know, academics can share with you. Um, you're being no shortage of, jo of jobs out there for you. Hawaii is changing. The way we manage our resources are changing, um, and they need the ike that we can bring with us to that. Oh, that's a really great answer, and I, I love that. Yeah, that's moving forward. Definitely, the jobs are not out there yet. Um, but maybe they are, like you're saying. I'm um, oh, sorry. So this other question is, um, why surfers, like as compared to other um, other communities that interact with the environment? Because surfers, they know how to read the surf, but not necessarily. Does that show them how to care for the ocean ecosystem? Yeah. Um, I looked at surfers because I was interested in technology and trying to understand. 
Um, if I want to look at climate change and talk to people about graphs and data, they are the people who do that. Um, and again, you might not think that they care about the ocean, but I don't think there is a single a single surfer, at least in Honolulu, um, that didn't care about that place as much as they cared about surf. People who only care about surf wouldn't have the site fidelity to probably surf at Honolulu. You kind of have to be a dedicated surfer to um, to surf in our cold Honolulu waters. So I can't generalize that all surfers would probably be a good fit for this, but the surfers here in Hilo, um, that's where I was trying to test and tease apart the differences. Um, because we asked, I asked over a hundred questions actually in these surveys and some of it was trying to understand how they were connected to place and to see if their, you know, their observations of change and surf conditions um, were dependent on their connection to Honolulu, but none of those things played out. So it didn't really matter their age. It didn't matter if they're connected to place. And actually all of them scored super high in their connection to place. Um, and I haven't found another user group that is relies on the environment to do their work for recreation, right? That's different than relying on your environment to be a, a farmer per se or to be a local EA person, you're gonna be observing that ocean for something else. I'm trying to talk to general people, people who don't talk about climate change on their daily notice, right? The surfers are gonna surf. They don't really think about climate change. And that's actually what I learned from a lot of them. They really enjoyed the conversation that my students and I had with them because climate change is something that they don't hear about normally. Um, and this was you know, about five years ago. I think it's a lot more common now, but five years ago, the fire captain on Hawaii Island didn't really understand how climate change was gonna affect him. And I talked to him about, well, you've already seen it this year. The surf conditions are different. Kona is getting pounded and Hilo and, Co and the Puna coastline was flat, flat, flat for months. And they kept having problem with Opihi fishermen um, because they weren't used to the new changing ocean um, conditions. Um, and so, yeah, there is, It'd be fun to work with many different communities and how climate change affects them. Um, but what I was doing in my dissertation, I wasn't focused on indigenous communities. I was trying to focus on kind of larger um, communities of place um, and people who um, generally don't know much about climate change and still understanding, you know, how much they could have observed that the climate has changed, even if they don't believe or know that climate change is happening. Thanks for the questions. Oh, thanks. Please give me Yeah, more. no, thanks for the... <laughs> Yeah, Let me know if I should stop answer. sharing my screen, if it makes oh, a difference. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, maybe um, so people can like see you a little better. Um, so um, actually, another question, and this one is about Honolulu, um, is so what are your predictions for how Honolulu is going to change in the next five to 10 years, given the reduced rainfall and less wind? Yeah. So when I asked them, I have to go back and look at all the data I got, because now it's been five years since I asked them five years ago what it'd be. So it'd be nice to return to them. Um, but what we know is that, you know, we have different surf based on the different conditions. So what we have now, we have reduced wind and reduced rain, but we have bigger storms. And so we have different conditions. So we have more paddleboard conditions. There's a lot of people out there. Um, you know, doing that new kind of um, paddle boards, no one would ever do that before, but now it's a big thing because it's nice and flat. Um, and then you get the big surf that comes in with these storms and big conditions. And so we have less of the in between, but we have more of the extremes, it seems. Um, and I think that's what's going to continue into the future, the kind of these extreme surf conditions. We also know that as we kind of saw in that one graph, we're getting more surf out of the north, which means that our Kaipalawa break is going off in Hilo. So downtown Hilo has more of a break and you see more and more surfers surfing the point there, I mean in Kyokaha, than they do at Honolulu. So it, um, Honolulu is gonna continue to change, um, but just as the Aina has changed, so has the communities. So when I was a kid, it's kind of sketchy to go down there you know, there is, a, um, it was all overgrown. You're kind of weed whacking down the side of the mountain. Um, you know, there was a lot of drug and alcohol activity. And now because of the um, Brada Skibs and all the work that they're doing, Aloha Honolii, um, it's a place for families. Um, there's more of a sandbar because of the reduced stream flow. And that sandbar attracts keiki and little kids um, and they can go up the river now. So I feel that Honolii is still gonna be a place to surf that we'll still be able to be where Hiiaka was hundreds of years ago. Um, and we'll just have to adopt to her as she changes also. Great. 
Uh, okay, so this one is the Song Kilo Hanakahi describes winds and seas of the different districts of Hawaii Island. Has your research mapped out, mapped out these kinds of cultural practices as like a knowledge of maps of natural phenomena um, at a, like, um, in conversation with um, maybe the molecular local level? I'm not sure if I <laughs> recited that question correctly. No, it's a good question. Um, that's what the proposal we hope to do in Waiahu and Maui will do. We want to kind of drill down and be able to map it out at different levels. One of the original questions that I had for Hawaii Island was I wanted to map out the ocean currents um, and understand how many different names for ocean currents we had in Hawaii. Because I grew up knowing about the Kavili current and the Haleea current that come from the Puna and the Kona side and they meet in Ka'u. Um, and so I always grew up hearing that mo'olalo. And so I wanted to map that and that's pretty much where it ended. There's not many current names that exist outside of channels or seas. Um, and so that is where my research has been going the last couple of years. I've had students who tried to look up all the different stories of Pailolo and Ka'i'i'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'e'
maybe that will show me the the traditional canoe voyages that people would take the landing ports the places that she um, left from um, and that will tell you where the ocean currents or the sailing conditions were the best when you're trying to travel from point a to point b um, and it has those changed through time so yeah all of those are really fun and i think our mo'olalos give us so much clues into our environmental history that we can take going forward um, and learn from them well I think that's all our questions and thank you for yeah all of your very thoughtful answers and your awesome presentations. So good luck with your work. Thanks for the invitation tonight. Okay, bye. Sweet home.